Hi, my name is Paul Elliott, call sign Whiskey Bravo 6, Charlie X-Ray Charlie. And my talk is um, called From Buoys to Turn Island Systems, and maybe back again. Um, thank you for showing up. And I'm going to talk about uh, sort of the long winding path, uh, starting with a Whisper Beacon, Raspberry Pi Direct Digital Output, um, inspiration for a, a drift buoy project, and with my friend Steve Roberts. Um, and then the work that went into to sort of figuring out how we would do that. Uh, ended up uh, upgrading my lab equipment. Um, designing some new test equipment, uh, realizing that maybe there's an opportunity to sell some of these, uh, to some of this test equipment, we'll see, and then forming a company with Steve, uh, Turn Island Systems. But along the way we're going to be discussing uh, clock generation, frequency synthesis, uh, SDR receivers, um, short antennas, all sorts of things that I found interesting. Um, um, who am I? Well, again, Paul Elliott, WB6CXC, live in Friday Harbor, Washington. I was licensed uh, way back in around 74, uh, and a couple years later got my um, advanced class license. Um, I didn't get around to getting my extra until just uh, 2016. But I've been playing with electronics uh, as long as I can remember, almost uh, at the age of 10 with my friends. Uh, we would be converting World War II surplus ARC-5 um, receivers, you know, tube radios, pulling out the plates, some of the plates and capacitors to tune them onto the ham band, and uh, pulling out the dynamotor power supply and plugging it in directly to, to 120 volts AC. Have to make sure we put the plug in the right way, otherwise you get a pretty bad shock if you touch the chassis. Um, survived that. Uh, rock and roll bass player occasionally. I enjoy it, don't do it enough. Got pretty good at it, but realized not good enough to make a living at it. But fortunately, I love electronics. I have, as I said, for quite a while. As, and um, so I started my career as a technician, test technician, um, a engineering technician, and then got uh, granted the title, if you will, of engineer. I do not have a degree. I barely finished high school. I just wasn't all that motivated back then. For this kind of stuff I was learning in high school, I'd rather play in my, my garage with, with my oscilloscope. Um, so my career, I've worked with audio, power, low frequency radio, um, transmitters, receivers, bunch of telecommunications, um, digital design, analog design, designed um, integrated circuits, um, a lot of work in fiber optics uh, most recently. Uh, I was a founding member in 1997 of a company called Serent, which was um, a pretty big deal back then if you were in that industry. This was fiber optics, telecommunications, uh, kind of at the transition from traditional telecom to the modern data-centric stuff. We were acquired in 1999 by Cisco Systems, um, and a couple years later I retired. Um, I was given the title Distinguished Engineer. I'm pretty proud of that because, um, you know, because of kind of what I worked my how I worked my way up. But um, I'll take the recognition if they'll give it to me. I appreciate that. Um, so what inspired this? Uh, so Raspberry Pi is how somebody's using it as a whisper uh, to generate the whisper FSK output signal directly, uh, you know, one of the digital output pins. Um, you can see on GitHub, uh, it's called a Whispery Pi. You can get a lot more details there. You can get more details on my blog. Um, there's a groups IO group uh, that uh, talks about similar uses of the Raspberry Pi direct digital outputs. Uh, maybe even got a video video transmitter on, based on this thing. Direct digital synthesis uh, of the output signals. 
Uh, and direct digital synthesis is something um, I find fascinating. I've used it a lot in my career. Simplest way is divide by n. Um, you know, we're going to run through some of the types here. Again, simple, kind of limited resolution. Um, very popular is what's called the numerically controlled oscillator, the NCO. Also called uh, DDS for direct digital synthesis. That's a bit of a general term, but that's what it's called. Um, that can be very flexible, very you know, excellent resolution. Uh, use a wide parallel output word to go into a sign lookup table and into a D to A converter and generate very clean sine waves. Um, or arbitrary waveforms, that's how most arbitrary waveform generators are designed. Or you can use what's called a fractional divider or clock dropping divider. That's what the Raspberry Pi uses inside for the whisper mode. Um, and I do like fractional dividers. So they'll show up again later on in this presentation. Uh, the Pi, um, it has fairly poor frequency resolution with its divider. Um, at 14 megahertz, the frequency steps available are about 400 hertz. It gets worse at higher frequencies. Now with Whisper, we've got 1.465 hertz uh, FSK. Um, so how in the world do you get 1.465 uh, if your resolution is 400? All the way you do it's with uh, software. You rapidly change the divisor values in software. You modulate back and forth, uh, shift back and forth at a rate that provide, gives you an average of the frequency you're trying to get. Um, and there are things you can do to clean that up. Um, it's called MASH, multi-stage noise shaping. is a, method of adding timing noise, uh, high frequency noise, it's a dither, it's a dither. Uh, it sort of spreads the transitions out in time and uh, it, you know, reduce the peaks of the strong spurious amplitudes and kind of smear them out, makes it easier to, to clean up later. Uh, also with the Raspberry Pi transmitter, they've got in software itself, uh, the MASH is a hardware you know, built into the device, but you can also, there's also software that does a similar type of phase or frequency dither uh, to spread out the, the artifacts, and we'll be talking about some of these artifacts here. Um, here's a Raspberry Pi transmitter I've built, um, Raspberry Pi. The output needs a filter. I'll talk about that. Here's my first filter. Uh, here's the second version. I've um, coupled it up with a, an SDR. This is the SDR play receiver here. And I've built a little TR switch right here on top of the Pi, which will couple my antenna, either the output of the Pi or the input to the SDR. Uh, here's my filter. This thing's running at, at 14 megahertz. And this was my whisper transmitter for many years. Um, I shut it down because I needed the antenna for something else, but uh, it's been picked up around the world, 10 milliwatts output, direct digital generation. Um, it's pretty fascinating, really. The output of the Pi, it's not a clean square wave. You can see that the timing, it's got, you know, you might call it a comb, or it's a, it's a, a jitter, but it's very precise jitter. Uh, here, these are, they're about, they are two nanoseconds apart, and that's directly because of the 500 megahertz internal clock. That's the period of 500 megahertz. Uh, and this is the kind of uh, jitter or, or comb or dither that you will see um, on many clock synthesis uh, uh, designs. Um, the Pi is pretty symmetrical output, you know, very square wave, a uh, few odd harmonics if you look at it as a, you know, classical standard waveform. Um, this is 160 meters, uh, 1.8 megs. You can see strong fundamental. These are all odd harmonics up here. If they are even harmonics or other spurs that are down there. So it looks pretty classical. Um, standard square wave uh, spectrum. And this only runs up to 100 megahertz here, but it, the harmonics keep on going. Um, people are using uh, the Raspberry Pi output, at, I believe at 2 meters even. Um, so good sharp edge digital signal. At 160 meters, if we uh, zoom in 
close, fairly close. This is a hundred hertz. Uh, uh, pardon me, uh, 50 kilohertz bandwidth uh, span. You can see we've got you know a good strong signal there, but we've got these spurs down there. Um, I haven't analyzed these particular ones, but these are the kind of spurs you might see with this kind of type of frequency th synthesis. And I'll show you detail up here. Uh, running at a 50 megahertz, got a good carrier here, um, but down here and over here, got some spurs. And uh, it'd be kind of tough to filter that out, actually. It's not down very far. Looks like it's, uh, it's only about 30 dB down, 35 dB down. Um, FCC you know, would not meet FCC requirements. So where's that come from? Um, well, if it's not a, you know, a harmonic, uh, it's not a standard mixing product. But if you shift the carrier by 100 kilohertz, notice that the spur shifts by 900 kilohertz. That tells us that spur is actually the ninth harmonic of the fundamental 50 megahertz output. Um, but that ninth harmonic, 453 megahertz, is alias back down by the sample clock. Um, any harmonics above sample clock divided by 2, 250 megahertz, will be alias back down in frequency. So, with this again, with this kind of synthesis, you will see aliases, and you have to uh, be aware of them and know how to deal with them. Here we are, my uh, 20 meter whisper beacon, the raw output, fundamental, odd harmonics. But we've also got these. These are not even harmonics. These are our sampling spurs. Um, it's it's a mixing of sorts. You can analyze it. Um, using mixing uh, terminology, if you will. Uh, but this spur is only 33 dB down from the fundamental FCC. Again, 43 dB requirement, dBc requirement for the uh, for the output purity. This spur happens to be the 35th harmonic of the 14 megahertz fundamental, and it's alias back down to 7 megahertz by the 500 megahertz sample clock. So. To filter that, a standard low-pass filter, which people have been using with this type of transmitter, uh, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Uh, if it were flat, it wouldn't do such a good job with that seven, with that seven megahertz spur. Um, so we'll take a look at how we deal with that. Coming in closer, you can see we've got a good signal here. Um, this has got a 50 kilohertz uh, span, and these spurs don't know exactly where they're coming, where they come from, but you know, could figure it out. Uh, but they're down, you know, about 70 dB, so that's uh, that's quite good. We can zoom in even closer, and hey, we got some close-in spurs here. To be honest, I'm not sure if these are spurs or if they're um, 60, 120 hertz sidebands, um, you know, hum. I tried playing with the power supply. Um, tried several different types, including some very smooth linear supplies. Didn't seem to make much difference, um, but it could have been fluorescent lights leaking into the, you know, coupling in or something. I don't know. Um, I didn't do the carrier shift test to try to characterize these, but I figured it, it was good enough. Um, it's down, you know, 45 dB or so, so um, it's not going to be a problem. So I decided good enough. I uh, so. I, because of that 7 megahertz uh, spur, I decided I needed a bandpass filter. Here's my topology. Just a bottom coupled twin tank circuit. It's it's a slightly over coupled here just to make it easier to, to have it fixed tuned. And here is the spectrum of the output of my transmitter after running through that filter. You can see it's uh, it's quite good. So um, again, this transmitter had it running for years. Got me thinking, drift buoys. People have been using Whisper for drift buoys, for balloon beacons. Um, so I thought it'd be fun to do one, build one up. Um, you can buy pre-made boards for this, but I'd rather do my own. Uh, it's a nice challenge. That's kind of what I'm doing this for. Um, so this is a friend, Steve Robertson, I started thinking about how to do this. So 
you know, this is kind of where we sit, where what we ended up with a PVC pipe, a battery for ballast at the bottom, maybe, maybe throw some rocks in there or something, or um, circuit board, um, solar panels, GPS, um, and probably a very short antenna, um, just because with the buoy, the longer the antenna, the um, more issues you have with stability. Um, And uh, so, but I want to send telemetry with the thing. Um, you know, you can use Whisper for position reporting. People have been doing that. Um, so, you know, regardless, uh, 40 meters, 30 meters, 20 meters, those are good frequencies for a uh, ocean-going um, beacon. Um, VHF could be used, uh, you know, in some of the balloons, but in the middle of the ocean, that's not such a great choice. Uh, as I said, people are using Whisper. Um, it's got excellent characteristics for uh, a small signal, um, you know, weak signal work. Uh, signal to noise ratio bandwidth are, you know, the uh, coding are excellent. Um, it's got forward error correction, which, you know, the one-way signal when you have no method of acknowledging, you know, you know, doing any sort of uh, two-way error correction. Forward error correction is really a requirement, I think. It's got a good worldwide receiving uh, reporting infrastructure, which is important because you need people to pick up your beacon wherever it ends up. Um, but it has limited data payload and very inflexible format. It's only got a few bits to play with, so that's understandable. But I kind of wanted to send more than just a position and maybe a couple bits of data. So I was looking at other, um, other options for um, what what the format would be? Um, FT8 is another very popular mode. Good low, not not as good as Whisper for weak signal, but still really good. Um, but when I started looking at it, it had very limited data capability. I think that's been enhanced now, but at the time um, there wasn't much you could do with it other than just make contest QSO. Uh, HF APRS 30 meters. Uh, that has all, all the, really all the features I want as far as uh, being able to, to send data back and I'll send data. Um, but that physical layer coding, um, it's, I think it was 300 bits per second FSK, uh, no forward error correction. Um, it just, for a weak signal, it, I just didn't think that was robust enough. I, I don't think it would have been robust enough. Uh, so unfortunately, as much as I like APRS, I don't think that was going to work for the buoy. Um, and then JS8 showed up. Um, about the time we started looking at this, JS8 was in its early uh, early stages. Uh, Jordan Shearer developed JS8 and the JS8 call program uh, spun it off from the open source FT8. Um, it's got FT8's forward error correction. But JSA has got a flexible data format, it's an extensible multi-frame data format. And he built in hooks to interface this to an APRS network. So you can send APRS messages through JSA. And uh, so you can send a text message or an email through through the APRS network. And if a gateway, JSA gateway station receives it, it will forward it to the APRS network. And that's pretty much perfect for what I needed. But we need gateway stations. JS8, they're in the early days, there are hardly any of them. Still nowhere near as popular as FT8. Um, there are more stations now. But so I was looking at how could I set up some uh, some gateway stations and wanted to be cheap, easy, good. Uh, well, maybe two of those. So cheap and easy. I can use an RTL SDR blog. Version three um, SDR. That's a it's a really it's a nice unit. It's an inex for an inexpensive unit. It's very nice. I'll talk a bit more about the capabilities of that and why I chose it. Raspberry Pi, um, gateway station, uh, SD card, and an RF preamp, and a front end filter, and um, USB power adapter, and a couple SMA connectors. Throw it all together for under a hundred bucks. Um, you probably spend that much again for the antenna and the coax, depending on how you do it. 
but that's about as cheap as you can make it when the antenna costs more than your receiver. Um, SDR Vlog version 3, it's got a nice uh, stable TCXO. It's got a software switchable bias tree, which is nice, so it will directly power your preamp if you want. Um, this device has got direct sampling, um, so you can run a signal in, um, add HF into it, at least low HF, and it'll use its 28.8 megahertz sample clock to, to clock it into the analog to digital um, converter. Um, in this mode, it uh, doesn't have a quadrature output, it's just single-ended output. Um, because of Nyquist, um, uh, you've got an aliasing point, uh, you know, half the clock frequency at 14.4 megahertz, so you can have aliases if you're above that frequency. You know, if signals above that frequency will alias back down below that frequency. Uh, so you need some pretty strong filtering with it. It's also only got an 8-bit A to D converter. Uh, the ex more expensive SDRs will have 12 or 14-bit A to Ds. Uh, so the dynamic range isn't as good as some, but for this application it actually works really well. Um, this is what it looks like. You can find more about this particular device uh, on rtlsdr.com. And uh, I've got links as well in my presentation. And here's the, the, the SDR. It runs ADC sampling the input at 28.8 megahertz. It runs through just one channel, not the not the Q, but just the I, and um, into uh, filters and out the USB port where it gets uh, processed by the computer, in this case the Raspberry Pi. Um, here's the aliasing stuff, spurious responses. If this is a 28.8 megahertz clock, here's the 14.4 megahertz um, clock over two. So if you're trying to tune 10 megahertz, and you have an alias and a signal at 18.8 megahertz shows up, that wraps right back down to 10 megahertz. So you need some good filtering. Uh, trying to do close to 14 megahertz, the alias is also are also very close to 14 megahertz, so you need some probably prohibitively awful filters in order to get um, it to work on the 20 meter band. But fortunately I'm looking at 7 megahertz and 10 megahertz. Uh, the SDR itself, RTL SDR, doesn't have any useful filtering. Other expensive SDRs actually have some pretty good switchable filters at the input. So here's my filter. Um, similar to what I used on the uh, Raspberry Pi transmitter, but I put a notch in the transfer here. Here's, here's the notch. Um, that notch is about 70 dB below um, the 10 megahertz uh, pass band there. Um, this notch here is because the uh, impedances are no longer 50 ohms, you know, outside of the pass band. So my cable length was reacting with the signals and creating, you know, mismatched cable type filters. But anyway, it's a cheap filter, but it actually works very well for these frequencies. Um, preamp may not actually need it, but it seemed to help. I combined, built my own preamp and filter, combined them onto one board. It's powered by the bias T coming out of the SDR. Um, I'll brush over this really quickly, but I'm using uh, on the Raspberry Pi software called CSDR, which is kind of a command line pipeline, or pardon me, piped uh, DSP tool set. You can build a single sideband uh, demodulator with it. Um, and filters and everything um, receive a noise floor about 0 0.005 microvolts, which is you know very good, probably much lower than you need for uh, given the normal atmospheric noise and on HF. Um, but I tested the receiver against um, you know commercial ham ham rigs uh, for receiving FT8 and uh, JS8, and it. It held its own very well. You um, have to do tricks with the time synchronization because of the DSP pipeline delays. Um, but this uh, station, I built a couple of them. Uh, actually, I got this set up like this running in two locations on the West Coast right now. 
Uh, one's running at 10 megahertz, one's running at, at um, 7 megahertz. Got a couple different ver versions of my filter board, prototype, and then the circuit board that I had made. Um, this little box is just splitting my one antenna into the for the two different receivers. This guy here is an AIS receiver. That's a marine ship uh, position reporting service. I picked that up at this location and uh, forward that into the network as well, the ship reporting network, just because I, I find it interesting. Uh, back to the drift buoy transmitter. Um, didn't want to use a Raspberry Pi transmitter, as cool as that is. It really sucks too much power. Um, so the, I felt that building a simple controller, kind of Arduino style, uh, driving a Silicon Labs 5351 clock generator uh, chip, talk more about that, and having that drive a Class E uh, one watt power amplifier. I'm going to include GPS, uh, nine axis sensors, uh, flux gate, um, strain, and gyro. Um, you can do all sorts of stuff with that. And temperature sensors, and you know, collecting some data that we can report back. Um, want to run at 7 megahertz and maybe 10 megahertz and probably use a very short antenna. As I mentioned, long antennas are a hassle on a buoy. Um, so let's say the antenna is one meter long. Um, go through the numbers here. Um, you end up losing about 20 dB in the antenna matching network probably if you're lucky. So that means with one watt input, we're only getting about 10 milliwatts into the antenna. Uh, but 10 milliwatts can work around the world if, uh, if you're lucky. So, And we can always boost the transmit power a little bit. Uh, so I think that's doable. Um, the SI5351 clock generator. This is worth paying attention to if you're doing uh, any radio design or, uh, or just digital design where you need multiple clocks. It takes an oscillate crystal uh, input or an external uh, clock or oscillator source. Drives two phase lock loops that'll run in the 600 and 900 megahertz region. And then uh, we'll give you three outputs. The phase lock loops use uh, fractional clock dividers in the feedback loop. Um, so very, it can be very precise in terms of frequency. And uh, the output, they call them multi-synth here. Um, those have got fractional clock dividers in the outputs. Um, They've also got some phase shaping uh, that, so it makes it cleaner than what the Raspberry Pi did. It, it's actually extremely clean going out, well, comparatively clean. So with this device, you can get um, outputs you know, ranging from 5 kilohertz to 200 megahertz, you know, independently on three outputs. It's, uh, it's pretty powerful stuff. Um, there's some, uh, some things you can't do with it. Um, some frequency relationships because you've only got two phase lock loops, but three outputs. Um, but still, it's extremely flexible. I like this part a lot. Um, so the code, JS8 code, is based on FT8, the early version. Uh, FT8 code, I'd call it challenging. It's a mix of Fortran and C++ and I think other stuff too. I, I got the. I looked at the code again. It's open source. And I was able to convert most of it to the Ar, you know C plus plus that Arduino is using. But I kind of got hung up testing the forward error correction code. It, um, I think I had it right, but I couldn't find a good way to really test it. Then, it, so I was I kind of hit the wall there. But then it turned out somebody else had figured it out. RF0.net. Nice board the guy put together, and he's got the code freely available for it. It'll run JS8, FT8, Whisper. Um, it's uh, got the 5351 uh, clock generator I was talking about. It's got a controller on it, Arduino style controller. Um, got a GPS on it. It's a nice board. I bought a board even though the software is for free. I've been talking with the guys, so sort of felt it was right to actually buy the thing from them. I'll be using the code um, on my own hardware. Uh, Temperature compensated crystal oscillators. Um, use a TCXO to drive that clock generator. Use a TCXO, you know, on the drift buoy. And I was putting together test gear. Um, I needed a new frequency counter. 
I didn't like the ones, cheap ones didn't do what I wanted, and the expensive ones, all well, they were expensive, so I wanted to make my own. And while I was putting this together, I was finding funny things with, with the TCXO. Um, or was it a funny thing with my design? I wasn't sure yet. So I needed to get some better reference clocks. Uh, had a Trimble GPS Thunderbolt GPS discipline oscillator, um, surplus stuff I put together. Um, for a while, I was, had a working rubidium oscillator, um, but then I lost it in my garage. It's somewhere. Uh, but ended up really using the Leo Bodnar's uh, GPS disciplined oscillator. And I'll have links to, to Leo's stuff also. It's a nice unit. I'll show a picture of it. This is the Bodnar unit, USB, um, GPS antenna, and an output. You can I'm running it at 10 megahertz, but it's uh, got flexible frequency output. One of my rubidium oscillators looks like. Here's the Trimble GPS discipline oscillator. Run them all through a uh, what's sold is a video distribution amplifier, pretty cheap on eBay surplus. Uh, they work really well for 10 megahertz and 1, one hertz clocks also. Uh, so that feeds, you know, the output of the GPS DO feeds this, and then the output of the distribution amplifier feeds uh, a lot of my test equipment. Oscillator, TCXO. This is the kind of stuff I, I was seeing things like this happen when I was measuring the oscillator or when I was measuring other sources with my frequency counter that used the Fox TCXO inside my frequency counter. Uh, it would jump up and down like that. And I thought, is my uh, the FPGA I have, the code in there, is, is I have timing problems? Kind of looked like it. But it it took me a while to figure it out. Um, this is this plot here is the um, software I wrote using the uh, data coming out of my frequency counter, and I'm analyzing it. This is just time in this case from left to right, frequency up and down. Uh, these are the one hertz, pardon me, one tenth of a hertz, 0 0.1 hertz steps uh, or frequency resolution of my counter. Um, Depends on what mode, what my uh, divisors are, but in this case it was one tenth of a hertz frequency resolutions. That makes sense. But then what was happening here? What was happening here with that big jump? Turns out it was the TCXO. Um, after a lot of a lot of struggling, I realized that it was actually the TX TCXO that was uh, shifting back and forth here as it tried to do digital corrections. For frequency, the TCXO, you know, give it credit, it stayed within its tolerance specs, but this kind of behavior isn't very good. Let's say you're using it to generate Whisper, which has, you know, the 1.2 or whatever it was hertz uh, uh, frequency, uh, you know, f tone spacing, FSK, and if your uh, clock source is jumping by one hertz here. Um, that's going to pretty well screw up your transmitted or received signal if you're using it for whisper or any other really narrow band mode. Um, I needed uh, better testing, especially over temperature. I'm out of, I have a toaster oven that I'm using for um, surface mount reflow. So I modified my controller. I built a controller for the toaster oven. Modified it to give me good uh, temperature control in the ambient up to maybe 100 degrees centigrade. Um, Celsius, sorry, um, but I need to really get things cold, so I bought what's called a reptile incubator, and you may have seen people on the net using this uh, for a temperature chamber. It's pretty interesting. Uh, it uses a thermoelectric cooler, which you know your versatility becomes a thermoelectric heater. So it has a range of about five degrees C up to sixty degrees C. Um, ended up not liking the way the controller was was controlling this thing. It would turn the fan off and on when it reached its set point, which played havoc with uh, the equipment I was testing as the airflow changed uh, when the fan turned on and off. So I do what I usually do. I ripped out the uh, control. I left some of it attached, but took over the TEC and fan controls, built my own little controller right here, uh, connect that to a computer, and, um, well, control it myself. Uh, this is what the, I 
got some software I was running on the Windows that's talking to my controller um, over a serial port, a USB serial port. This just shows the temperature chamber uh, switching from 50 degrees to 10 degrees. It takes about two hours to cool down and about an hour to, to heat up. The TEC is a better heater than it is a cooler, but it's still pretty slow. It's not a thermal shock chamber by any means. Um, this lower chart, this shows the, uh, I've got a PID, Proportional Integral Derivative Controller, so this is just kind of a debug screen showing me uh, how it's behaving. I can control the, uh, set the parameters, the coefficients here, and this shows me what the outputs of the various um, uh, control functions are. Um, so it ends up being pretty good. I've, I got rid of the fan problem by doing this, so I can have much better uh, control of the environment. Here's another, uh, my frequency counter uh, that I built that gives me the ability to uh, do some interesting evaluation. Here's, uh, uh, it'll hook up to my temperature controller, uh, temperature chambers. This is showing temperature over time. This one here is showing frequency over time. Here you can see that Fox TCXO uh, doing its uh, nasty changes. And this chart here is frequency versus temperature. Temperature is, you know, cold, hot. Frequency is too high, you know, it's high and low there. So you can see uh, the stair steps. Anyway, you can see the changes over temperature. So a really nice way of evaluating an oscillator. Um, so I said the TCXO, it stayed in the spec, but I really didn't like those jumps. Uh, would have caused problems or at least the very least been annoying. So looking for new oscillators, uh, new surface mount TCXOs, um, Abercon, who I ended up using. Um, there's an interesting MEMS oscillator, Silicon Time, SI Time makes a number of these. MEMS stands for Microelectrical Mechanical Systems. Instead of a quartz resonator, it's a silicon resonator. It's kind of machined I assume chemically machined uh, onto the silicon chip. I'm not sure if they integrate the electronics. I suppose they might. But anyway, um, nice characteristics. It's going to be very, very stable. Um, interesting stuff. While I was evaluating these, I learned about something called retrace. Retrace was new to me. And it, again, it had me puzzled for a while. Here you see retrace on that Abercon um, TCXO. These TCXOs are all at 10 megahertz. Here we've got temperature and frequency. And notice, almost looks like a hysteresis curve there. When it's heating up, it follows one track. When it's cooling down, it follows another track. If it starts somewhere in the middle, it will sort of uh, eventually maybe get back on the tr one of these tracks. But, you know, at a given temperature, the frequency could be anywhere in there. And at first I thought it was due to thermal path delays. You know, maybe my temperature sensor was, uh, and the uh, device under test were not heating and cooling at the same rate, which would cause something like this. Uh, but I would slow down or speed up the temperature ramp, and it really didn't change much. And finally, I realized this is called retrace. Turns out it's a pretty well-known phenomenon. Didn't take long to find it. There's a lot of published stuff on it. Um, this is also retrace is also a problem with of an ice crystal oscillators. Um, one of the reasons they don't always return to the same frequency after you uh, cool them down, you know, shut them off and turn them back on again. Um, the silicon, the SI time, the MEMS oscillator has a different shape to its uh, temperature compensation curve, but again, you can see there is retrace in that silicon resonator. Uh, here you can see the effects of the uh, fan turning on and off in the uh, that reptile incubator. This is before I built my own controller for it. Uh, you can't really see the effect here in the te raw temperature, it's, but it does show up there, and, and that stuff disappeared when I made the fans more stable. So, retrace. It's interesting stuff. Um, as a sanity check, I just put together a cold pits crystal oscillator using a junk box crystal, didn't try to temperature compensate it, and uh, threw it in the oven just to see, you know, was I 
really seeing what I thought I was seeing. And yep, here's a retrace in the standard crystal oscillator. It's an AT cut junk box crystal. You can see the various inflection points here. So moving on, uh, to kind of show me the limits of temperature compensation. I planned on using a temperature sensor to do a secondary temperature compensation. But it turns out there's only so much you can do. It's probably still worth it, but won't be as effective as I had originally been hoping. Um, which led all of this, uh, you know, it's developing some interesting test equipment. Um, my friend Steve and I kind of kicked around some ideas. Uh, Steve's got some pretty cool ideas of his own. So we decided to form a company, Turn Island Systems. We're just getting started. Goal is to develop and sell um, interesting, useful technology. Um, this is not going to sell this. This is my first piece of test equipment using the 5351. Uh, it was just so useful. Um, three outputs, uh, Siri, um, USB control. I used this one a lot just for a, a nice signal source when I was testing other stuff. Um, so this ended up turning into this, what we call the uh, 5351 clock box, TIS, Turn Island Systems clock box. Um, three outputs. It'll, um, I've added, this is Definitely an improvement from the Altoids tin. It's got 50 ohm output, um, AC or DC coupled. You can select that software selectable. It's a clock generator. It's not an, an arbitrary waveform generator. It's not a traditional um, RF generator. Can't control the output amplitude. Uh, square wave output, 3.3 volts unloaded. It's got an internal TCXO reference, uh, the Abricon, the nice one. Uh, you can also feed an external 10 megahertz reference into it to, to synchronize this to your, uh, you know, clock standard USB interface, ASCII commands, uh, Windows control program. If you want to go beyond the ASCII commands, and it is it's based on the 5351 chip, no bones about it. Um, there's a control program. You can set frequencies, turn the outputs on or off, AC/DC coupling. Um, here you can control, you can see all the internal registers and you can change those. You can see how the frequency uh, control affects the registers. You can communicate with a serial, uh, you know, with the terminal interface there. Or you can just see how the box, uh, how the software talks to the box. Um, I'm using what's called the Ferry Fraction Algorithm to calculate these dividers because these are very you know, the denominator is a little bit over one mil, you know, one to one million or zero to one million. Pardon me, one to one million. And uh, to calculate, to get the best possible frequency uh, fit, you know, to what you want, uh, can be pretty complicated. So the software does an excellent job at that. Um, and Time interval counter. This was my first prototype. I showed that at one of, at uh, my local ham club, and uh, got some enthusiastic response to it. That was nice. Uh, this uses an Arduino type uh, controller, an Adafruit. It's an itsy bitsy controller. Is using a tiny FPGA BX uh, kind of FPGA development board, and uh, a TCXO. I actually had the Fox TCXL, which is one of the first places I saw that issue. And uh, this morphed into this, the time interval counter. Um, this one actually has four inputs. Any of those inputs can be used as a 10 megahertz reference. Um, inputs are selectable, 50 ohms, 1 mega ohm, compatible with times 10 scope probe in the 1 mega ohm mode. It's got four zero dead band measurement channels. You can do timestamps, frequency period, data logging, you know, pulse width, um, a lot of uh, a lot of stuff with it. It's pretty powerful. Um, you saw some of the software that goes with it. I was using that for evaluating the crystal oscillators, and got a new version. Uh, this is the latest version of the board. I'm still waiting for the board to come back. I cleaned it up, but this is kind of what's going on inside. Uh, not super complicated. Um, so, and here we are. We've got some links. Um, my ham blog, wb6cxc.com. Um, some of the sources I use uh, Leo Bodnar, 
time lab. This one I didn't mention, but it's nice uh, tools for doing oscillator analysis. Um, RF0, RTL, SDR. The pi transmitters I was talking about. If you want to contact me, Paul, wb6cxc.com or Paul at turnislandsystems.com. Steve at turnislandsystems.com. Well, thank you for uh, tuning in. I hope you found this interesting and look forward to any, uh, any response or feedback. Again, thank you.